Hey everyone, I'm Peter Askim and I'm the artistic director of the next festival of emerging artists and we're so happy that you're all here. Uh, the next festival is was started in 2013 to be helpful to early career classical musicians, performers, composers and choreographers. And when the pandemic hit, we jumped right in and since just about a year ago, since the end of March in 2020, we have been presenting uh, lots of workshops and talks, master classes and information sessions to keep you informed and inspired and to give us all a sense of community. And so I'm really happy that you're all here. Um, this is the third of a three workshop session with 410 Media. If you're here, you probably know who they are. Um, but all I have to say is the last two sessions have just really, really been interesting and exciting and inspiring. Um, and Evan is here and um, I've warned him that there are going to be questions. So it's kind of a uh, he'll he'll tell you when he wants them, but uh, he, he knows that you're here to learn. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Just a couple things that we have that are coming up. Um, we have workshops coming up the next few weeks, which are going to be really, really exciting. So this is 410 uh, is today and then Next Thursday, uh, we start, um, we do a workshop with Ryan Strieber of Octavan Audio on recording new music at home and in the studio. The week after that, April 1st, Ashley Bathgate is going to present three world premieres. So for our 2020 festival, we had three early career composers who've written just gorgeous works for cello, uh, cello and electronics and cello electronics and voice. And if you know Ashley, you know that um, she's covering all of those really beautiful music. So that's April 1st. April 8th, we we continue our series with Elaine Grogan Luttrell of Minerva Financial Arts on financial issues that you really need to know about as, uh, as an artist or, or somebody who's interested in the arts and this kind of strange time that we're navigating. So I'm really glad that you're all here. Um, I just put in the chat our website and also 410 Media's website. Um, we've present, been presenting all of these workshops for you for free um, as a service to all of you and to create a sense of community, but it's, we also pay all of our artists since the very beginning. Um, it's more important than ever that the people who are providing value to all of us are compensated as fairly as possible. So if you'd like to help us make that possible, uh, make a tax deductible donation through that link that I put in the chat. Uh, once we get started with Evan, I'll put up some links to our upcoming events, and uh, thanks for being here. It's really great to see you all, and I know that you're going to really enjoy uh, this third workshop on post-production secrets. Take it away, Evan. Thank you so much, um, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, so today we're going to be talking about post-production. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you were around for Kevin's uh, presentation last week um, that was for you know production, lighting and camera and that kind of stuff. So we're gonna basically take over from where he left off. Um, just two quick notes about um, kind of how uh, this is gonna go down. Um, I'm gonna talk pretty specifically about performance videos, music performance videos um, and kind of like multi-cam uh, performance videos since I think that's probably what a lot of musicians are doing um, from home these days. Um, so. You know, they're obviously more um, kind of narrative creative um, edits like, you know, mini docs or interviews or that kind of thing. But we're going to kind of be talking about performance videos. Um, and then secondly, um, I will be working in Adobe Premiere, um, Premiere Pro. Um, but because there are one tons and tons of tutorials about the nitty gritty of um, just various techniques within Premiere on YouTube and also because you know, people are in different programs like Resolve and, um, you know, Final Cut and all these different kinds of programs. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about kind of workflow things and broad idea things versus like actually teaching the specifics of Premiere. We'll go into a little bit of that, but I also just want to talk mostly about our workflow and how it might um, translate to the projects that you're doing. Um, and so first, before diving into my uh, premiere screen over here, um, I actually want to take a step back to um, kind of a little bit of overlap with Kevin's session, which is basically the steps that you can take when you're shooting um, to ensure that you have a successful editing process. Um, there are definitely some things that you can do 
um, on the day that will make the edit possible or way easier. Um, so not everything needs to be basically cleaning up everything that you did on the shoot and after the fact, um, there's actually a lot that you can do on the day to prepare yourself to be able to edit quickly and easily and um, painlessly. So, um, and this kind of might be familiar to, you know, if anyone has ever done any audio recording, you know, if it sounds good on the day and it's recorded with a good mic in a good room with a good player and a good in tune instrument, it's probably going to sound good uh, once you get to the mix. Uh, whereas if you're playing on an out of tune instrument in a closet that sounds horrible with a crummy mic, um, it's going to take a lot to get that mix to back to what you want it to be. Uh, and same thing applies with video. Um, you know, if you're in a nice room um, and you know how to light it and you take these couple steps that I'm going to go over on, you know, settings and camera placement and that kind of stuff, it's going to make your editing life way easier than trying to clean up whatever mess you made uh, on the shooting day. Um, so the first of those things are basically thinking through before you shoot um, the eventual camera angles um, that you think you're going to be you're going to want to be cutting uh, in between in in whatever uh, video it is so whether that's an interview and you're maybe doing two cameras um, or whether it's a performance video and you know if you're a pianist you might want a wide a close-up of fingers a medium and a close-up of the face or something like that um, really thinking through what you're going to want when you edit um, to actually shoot according to that so, you know, instead of like on the day, just sort of throwing some cameras on tripods and maybe framing each one separately as its own thing, actually trying to take a step back before you press record um, and think about what am I going to want to cut to once I eventually edit this. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit that you can do with reframing and these kinds of things in the edit. But if you plan ahead and you really think through where each camera, where you want it to be, um, it's just going to make your life way easier when it comes time to edit. So anytime that Kevin and I go into a shoot, um, we have, you know, listened to the pieces enough or the piece enough um, to know what kind of edit we're going to go for, whether it's cutting rapidly between between a lot of close-ups that are like you know really intensely on someone's eyes or fingers or that kind of thing or whether we know it's going to be a much more epic spacious wide shot um, and then we shoot accordingly so we don't always rely to make on all of those decisions after the fact. Um, the other thing which might come as you know kind of obvious beforehand but when you're in the heat of the moment when you're trying to record something you might forget is to stay organized with your um, slating and take numbering and that kind of thing. So really staying on top of, um, you know, if you want to give a, a clap for audio video sync um, and also just saying take one, take two, take three. Once again, it seems simple when you say it, but when you're in the thick of doing something and you might be in a time rush for whatever reason, um, these are the kinds of things that start to fall on the wayside. Um, and so, you know, really staying on top of making sure all of your camera and audio is slated together, you've said take names um, and you kind of stay organized. Maybe you even take notes of what went well during certain takes versus others um, that, or like marking takes that you liked on your camera, that kind of thing. Um, so getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty, um, something that is really important to do and we'll go into this a little bit more once I'm in my premiere screen, um, but making sure to match the settings on if you're shooting more than one camera. Um, so, you know, if you maybe have two DSLRs that you're working with, really taking the time to double check that they're each shooting at the same white balance, the same color temperature, that's a big one. Um, and the, the shutter speed, um, these kinds of things. We've gotten a lot of projects that we've edited from other people who shot them where we get mix matched color and shutter, uh, shutter speed and that kind of thing. Um, and so, um, once again, we'll go into this a little bit more a little bit later, but um, even if you're using a phone, there are actually ways, there are apps where you can go in and override um, the auto settings on the phone to actually be able to select your shutter speed and your ISO and your color temper temperature and that kind of thing. So even if you're just shooting with, you know, you and your partner's phone, you can even match those two together. Um, and these are just ways to save headache and time once you actually are editing. Um, and that brings me to my next point, which is um, try to stay off of auto settings as much as you can, um, because once it comes time to color and expose and make sure that your you know, brightness levels are matching, um, that kind of thing, it'll be a huge headache if your cameras were kind of searching for 
color and searching for the exposure the whole time and kind of fading in and out of them. Um, so, you know, if they all match at the beginning, even if it's a lot of work to get your cameras to match together, at least once you do it once, they'll match for the rest of the video, as opposed to if it's on auto, it might just, just kind of be fumbling around trying to figure out uh, which setting it should be at. So once again, even if you're shooting on a phone, um, there are ways to manually override um, and maybe um, I can send out a link um, to some apps that, um, that can do that on the phone. But then once you get to you know, mirrorless cameras and DSLRs and that kind of stuff, then it's very easy to um, just go in and change the settings yourself. Um, and then just to think about um, <clears throat> basically your framings for, you know, this kind of goes back to the shot type, but I think Kevin mentioned that maybe somebody brought this up last week, which is if you are filming yourself and you don't have another person operating a camera, um, so you're really relying on just static cameras that are on tripods, thinking about um, potential camera movement. Um, and so obviously if there's not an operator there who can physically move the camera, um, but you think that it's a piece that would benefit from maybe some zooming or panning or that kind of thing, um, just shooting in a way that you have that flexibility after the fact. Um, and so if, you know, if your camera that you're shooting on has 4K capabilities, um, like the resolution is 4K, but you're gonna edit in 1080, that gives you extra pixels to be able to reframe and you know you can kind of pan and zoom and do all that all of that stuff um, without losing pixels because you're taking an excess of pixels and then bringing them down to 1080 as opposed to zooming in what's already a 1080 image um, so we'll I, I can show examples of that once we get in but um, and then one last thing which um, actually sometimes still burns Kevin and me on shoots when we're stressed and running around is double check that your cameras are recording reference audio. Um, if you're recording with uh, different mics, um, you know, through an audio interface and you're doing audio separately, which might be um, what you end up doing, um, make sure that your cameras are getting good, clear audio because you'll need that to sync after the fact. Um, and there have definitely been times when Kevin and I will set up five or six cameras for a big shoot and we're running around and we didn't realize that one camera wasn't recording audio and then we have to go in and do it visually and it's a huge pain. So just double check that all cameras are set to the same settings and also that they're um, recording audio because you'll need the reference uh, tracks to sync, sync with. So I'm now going to move into uh, my Premiere screen. So I'm gonna share screen here. So um, <clears throat> for the sake of demonstration, I actually pulled up a project that Kevin and I just shot on Tuesday. So just a couple days ago, um, it was fresh on my mind and I was looking at the footage and ingesting some of it. So I figured it would be a nice uh, thing to just pull, pull people in on. Um, for those of you who were at Kevin's session last week, you'll notice that this is actually in the same uh, room as the video that he shared. Um, which is Rittenhouse Soundworks here in Philadelphia. Um, and so I'm basically gonna start from the top of our workflow, um, essentially. So anytime we, you know, we, we're done with the shoot and now we're gonna go edit. I'm gonna kind of talk you through the, the general steps that we take and things to look out for. So um, the first thing is to basically start from the get-go as organized as you possibly can. So. Um, you know, making folders for each thing um, that you get. Um, I think, you know, once again, this is a step that maybe in the heat of the moment, um, you might not think is a, you know, worthwhile idea to take the extra couple minutes to make folders and subfolders and that kind of stuff. But once you get further and further into the edit, it's really important to easily be able to reference where files are. And, um, you know, as the projects get bigger and bigger and there are more assets that are floating around, it's just really important to stay organized and um, you know, make a lot of folders. So you know, you'll see here, I have one for audio, which right now only has one track, but it could have more. Um, I have a footage, which is divided into my camera and Kevin's camera. Um, we actually shot more angles on this shoot, but for the sake of this project and simplicity, I just brought in a couple. Um, I have a MISC assets, which um, in this case is a letterbox overlay, which I'll show you in a little bit, um, but that's just any extra graphical elements that might play in, whether that's like a logo that needs to pop up at the end or that kind of thing. Um, this is specifically for this class, so that doesn't apply. And then this is my sequences folder. Um, so this is basically each of these sequences that I made here, and I'll talk this through in more detail, but 
Um, <clears throat> it's very likely that you won't just have one kind of edit sequence, but you'll actually have a couple different sequences that are at varying steps along the way. Um, so this one kind of has our full um, dump of everything. It has a synced, which is not colored. Then it has a, a synced plus coloring on it. Then we have what will eventually be our edit here. And then we have a final pass, which would add any um, extra color grading or titling or any of that kind of thing. Um, and this would be the one that you would eventually export when it came time to deliver. So um, you'll see also that I, um, I tend to color code everything. It just helps me visually, um, especially once the projects become much larger. Um, you know, if you're doing a lot of takes of something and you're actually recording audio at the same time, um, actually going in and color coding. So you can maybe say like, you know, your blue is your take one, your green is your take two, et cetera. So once you start to stack them, you can easily see what's what. Um, because, you know, these long file names aren't necessarily going to help you know what's what, um, unless you were to rename them. Um, so color coding is a really useful tool. Um, and then, so now when it's actually time to uh, start making your first sequence, so in this case, you know, this full bin was the first that I made, which is really just a place to dump everything, um, just to kind of look through and take stock of what we have. Um, it's really important to make sure that when you make your sequences, you're making them at the same settings as what you shot at. Um, and so in Premiere, when you go to make a new sequence, um, just going into the settings and double checking that your frame rate is right. So, you know, our cameras were shooting at 23.976 frames a second. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I have that selected. Um, I want the eventual frame size to be 1920 by 1080, um, which is also the same um, aspect ratio that we shot in. Um, we're eventually going to crop it down with some letterbox, but for now, this is the, you know, the same resolution that we shot at. Um, and just making sure that all of these match your settings um, of what you shot at. And, you know, if there are any questions, you can go into the um, properties of the file itself. You know, you right click in your finder and it'll actually tell you, you know, what the resolution is and the frame rate and all that kind of stuff. Um, or once you pull it in here, um, you can also just drag this over and look at it. So, you know, I, I know that this footage was 23976. Um, if you go even further, uh, much further, you'll see that it was also 1920 by 1080, you know, um, has the audio information. So just making sure that your editing sequence matches what you shot at. Um, otherwise there's gonna be some discrepancies and the program is gonna try to make up for things that aren't actually there or don't align with, um, you know, the timings of the sequence and that kind of thing. So we will start with, um, well, so yeah, I have this full bin, which is basically everything. Um, this isn't, you know, a super important step, but I just kind of like laying everything out just to kind of quickly be able to see what we shot um, on the day. But then I will basically copy that sequence um, and then I will make my first sync sequence. So basically, which would start out something looking like this. Now, if I expand these, you'll see that you can see my audio waveforms here. And so this is why it's super important that um, the cameras that you're shooting at, you double check that they're recording audio. So this is just the onboard mic um, that we're on our cameras. So obviously not gonna be used for any mix or anything, but it's purely a reference to be able to sync everything together. So each camera um, has its waveform here. Um, now there are a couple of different ways to sync these together. Um, the easiest one, which if you're running all of the cameras at the same time during the same take, is to actually let the software do it for you. So in Premiere, you can just right click and you go to synchronize um, and you have it synchronized to the audio and you press OK and it'll automatically align everything so it's synced um, starting at the same point. Now, these files were actually from different takes, um, so the waveform before the actual piece varies a little bit with whatever talking we were doing. Um, so that auto synchronize actually won't work for these. Um, so in that case, it's usually just a matter of manually going in and lining up the waveforms. So if I had, you know, three different video files, say you were filming a single camera shoot, you know, you only had a phone or you only had a GoPro or something like that. 
Um, these would be your three separate takes, which wouldn't line up perfectly with their waveforms because they weren't actually shot at the same time. But um, they can be synced together um, by visually just lining up the waveforms. Um, and so obviously this works when you are uh, lip syncing um, along to a recording. So obviously if you're recording live audio, um, things aren't going to sync up perfectly from start to finish because your tempo, your tempo will probably fluctuate from start to finish um, unless you're some kind of tempo master robot or something. Um, and so in that case, um, I mean, honestly, for 410, it's usually just a matter of making sure that we have enough cameras running at any given time so that we actually don't need to sync or we don't need to stack takes from different, sorry, we don't need to stack files from different takes. Um, but we can actually just do a full multicam with, you know, four or five cameras that we're all running at the same time. Um, and I'll talk through ways to do that uh, in a little bit. But this example for right now is if you already had an audio recording done and you were just going to play along to it in a lip sync, which uh, on our first session, I think we talked about why that might not be possible in some instances, um, but in some it is. And in this case, it was. Um, the recording was already done, the audio recording. And we just went back in and we filmed ourselves, uh, or filmed Timo uh, playing the piece on top of it. So once I've gone through and um, synced up the waveforms here, and so you can see, um, you know, I'm lining up these hits um, that should match from take to take because we were playing along to the audio. Um, you know, I'm not gonna take a ton of time doing this here, but um, that's basically what it would be. Uh, looks like we had a different number of clicks there, but I would go off of the last one here. I'm not sure why that happened, um, which then would bring us to this synced sequence. And so this is kind of, you know, fast forwarding a few minutes uh, once you've already done that sync. And this is basically all of our video files stacked on top of each other playing at the same time. Um, now, even once you do this, um, there may be times when, you know, even though you were playing along to a recording, uh, the sync might have not been perfect for whatever reason. Maybe you, um, you know, rushed an entrance at some point. Um, you know, you were trying your best to play along, but you rushed an entrance, something like that. Um, there are a few ways to get around that, which kind of come in to play a little bit more in the edit. Um, but that's when it starts to get a little tedious with actually doing, um, you know, micro speed adjustments and that kind of thing. And so if you need to stretch the time between one note and another, but you rushed to that second note, you might actually just need to slow the clip down um, to 95% or whatever it might be, um, which you can only do to a certain extent before it actually starts to look choppy and you can actually tell that it was slowed down. In which case you might need to cut to something else like a shot of the face or you know some other kind of shot where you can't actually see that note being played. Um, now, like I said, the easiest way to avoid this um, is actually just to, if you know you're gonna to have to record audio at the same time, um, is actually just filming with enough cameras at the same time so that you don't need to stack a video on top of each other from different takes. Um, and obviously, you know, the idea of filming with a lot of cameras can seem daunting um, and it can seem expensive. Um, but I think what some, some people forget um, is that camera rentals uh, can actually be really cheap. Um, and so if you only see yourself you know, filming a couple of these full on performance videos that are going to be lip synced to audio and, you know, all this, this kind of production. Um, you know, a, a DSLR, a mirrorless camera can be like 20 to 30 bucks a day to rent. Um, and so if you rent it for one day, you know, you could hypothetically get a couple cameras for around 100 bucks. Um, obviously, if you're going to do it more than that, um, you would actually need to probably invest in buying the cameras, which is when things start to get expensive. But um, you know, it does save a lot of time in the long run when you're not trying to match video takes that weren't to an audio take, um, but you weren't lip syncing, you're were actually just playing along. Um, that's kind of where the most tedious edits tend to come up is when you really need to go in and manually speed, uh, change the speed of every clip to match the audio that's existing. Um, it can be a headache and for, you know, for people like Kevin and me who edit a lot, um, a lot of projects all, at, you know, in rapid succession, we just don't really have the time to do that. Um, and so when we know that we're going to have to um, record all of our video at the same time as the audio, we just plan accordingly and potentially rent an extra camera or two, um, that kind of thing, or just be creative with the couple angles that we do have, but ensure that we don't need to layer um, others on top of that. 
So um, once we have our footage synced, uh, actually, before I move on to color, um, are there any questions about the um, just kind of up until now, the organization and the bringing things into Premiere and uh, the rough ideas behind syncing? Is there anything from the chat here? I don't see anything coming yet, so I'm going to keep pushing ahead to coloring. Um, and so some people have um, different basically opinions and preferences on how to work with color. Um, I know some people who want to get through the entire edit first and then they apply the color at the end. Um, I personally at least like to um, get the color corrected before we do the edit, just, to, just so I can be looking at an image that looks correct um, when I'm actually making my multicam edit. So we'll basically do this in two phases. Um, the first time through, we'll basically just do a color correction pass. So there's really nothing creative about this. Um, you know, I'm not adding any crazy sepia or blue or whatever it might be. This is purely to get the camera to look um, correct and that the white balance is right where it should be. The skin tones look correct. Um, and if you're shooting on different models of cameras, um, actually matching the cameras to each other, which can be much, much easier said than done. Um, if you've ever tried to match you know, like a <laughs> Canon 5D to an iPhone, it can be really hard to make sure they look the same. Um, and so that kind of gets into um, another tip for the shooting day, um, which is actually to use a gray card or a white card um, to basically double check your white balance on the day to make sure that your cameras are shooting the same color. So I have an example pulled up here. So what you would do is they actually sell just kind of like neutral gray cards that you can hold up. Maybe some people have seen this for photography. Um, it's a, you know, some people will use this to reference in, in photography as well. Um, but basically you would get a neutral gray um, paper or card or something like that. You would put it under the lighting that you're using for the performance. So say you were lighting a piano, you would actually sit at the piano. So it looks like the lighting that you're lighting the piano with. Um, and then you would um, just film a few seconds of a reference image of that from each of your different cameras. And then once you do that, um, and you know, this is this specific workflow that I'm about to go into is, is pretty specific to uh, Premiere, but you know, most of the video editing software will have, well, all of them have some version of this, but for now I'm gonna look at the Premiere version, um, which is basically going in and telling the computer what the white balance is. And so actually taking an eyedropper to this gray here, if my, there we go. Taking a gray, uh, taking an eyedropper to the gray here and basically telling the computer that that is neutral, that is gray. Um, and so that's kind of our, our white balance point. And if you do that with multiple cameras, um, you'll basically match them all so that the white is, um, basically coming across the same in each of the, the video files. Um, and so you can match, you know, if one for some reason was rendering the color way cooler, like say this was the footage that you ended up uh, importing. Um, so pretend like that's just the footage that I shot. Then what you would do is you would go in with this and you would be like, no, no, that's actually gray. And then it would put it back to looking normal like that. So even if it's really messed up and it, you know, it looks really warm or it looks, looks really blue or purple or whatever it might be, then you go in with your eyedropper here and you basically tell the computer, this is the neutral and this is what it should be. Um, and sometimes my computer glitches out, but that's basically what it should do. Now, when you are filming with certain lower end cameras, um, so like your you know, iPhones or actually GoPros have some um, settings that can get around this, but basically the lower end cameras um, <clears throat> bake in a little bit more of, a, of color information um, than the higher end ones. So basically higher end cameras film a lot more, they have the option to film a lot more flat um, and that's called log. So I have a picture here, an example. Um, the left side of the image is basically what a higher end camera might film. And so it looks really desaturated. It looks really decontrasted. You know, the white point and the black point is pretty close to each other. 
And so when it films like this, you have tons of flexibility after the fact to basically change the look of this. So if you did by accident, you know, film at the wrong color temperature and everything comes out looking really blue or looking really warm, um, but you have all of this information to work with, it's not already super blue in the image itself, in the file itself, then you have a lot more flexibility after the fact with bringing it back to normal or doing whatever you want with it. Um, same thing goes with exposure. You know, if your highlights are, if your bright spots are really blown out or if your shadows are too dark, um, when it actually films to a log image like this, um, you actually, it retains a lot of that information and you can salvage it after the fact. Whereas if you're shooting on something a little bit lower end, um, it might already look like the right image just straight out of the camera because you know if someone's just taking a snapshot on their iPhone, um, they might just want it to look good already without having to, to do a lot of work to it. It already looks saturated and vibrant and contrasty and the shadows are dark and the highlights are bright and but that's all baked in already and there's nothing you can do to change it. Um, and so that's kind of um, where the cameras start to benefit the others is basically how much um, flexibility you have after the fact with changing or salvaging or whatever you might want to do to the image itself. Now, obviously, a lot of us are working with um, kind of lower end cameras. Some of us may just be using, um, you know, smartphones or lower end DSLRs or mirrorless or whatever that might be, um, which is fine, um, but you would just need to shoot in a way that you know that this is all you have to work with is that kind of baked in color look as opposed to the log. So maybe you're a little bit more conservative with your lighting and you make sure it's not quite as contrasty when you're shooting um, because you know that you're not gonna be able to salvage any highlights that are blown out or you're not gonna be able to expose up any shadows that are, have gone to complete pitch black. Um, so it's just, if you have the option to kind of shoot a flatter um, log color profile, um, it'll just free up your options for color um, moving forward into the edit. And so you'll see, in this first sequence where we have the sink, this is without any color applied. <clears throat> and so this looks really, really flat. Um, you know, the, it's, it's pretty desaturated. Um, there's not a lot of contrast. It just looks very flat. But then if we move that over to my colored version, you'll see how much more everything pops. So, you know, the warms are warmer, the cools are cooler, um, the shadows are lower, the highlights are higher. And so at this point, I've basically gone through and applied a color that essentially brings it back from this left-hand log image up to the right-hand um, kind of, we call it a Rec 709, uh, which is kind of the color space that actually has the full information, saturation and contrast information. Um, and so I haven't really made any creative decisions to this color yet. This is purely just to bring it from this flat log image to kind of a normal kind of standardized Rec 709 um, image here. Um, and I'm not gonna, <clears throat> we don't have the time to go into the really nitty gritty of, um, you know, like color curves and exposure curves and that kind of thing. And once again, there are lots and lots and lots of tutorials by people who know a lot more about that than I do. But um, generally this is kind of our first step or at least, you know, personal preference for me is to at least get it looking like this before I edit the multicam just because this is a lot more fun to look at than a, you know this kind of flat log image. It's not very inspiring to edit along with. Um, and so that would be basically my new copied sequence. Um, and so you know, in case it wasn't clear up until now, the reason why I make these copied sequences is basically if I want to redo anything after the fact, it's easy for me to revert back to a previous version that I had. So say I just, you know, I totally botched this color pass and maybe I had already saved and quitted out of Premiere, so it was too late to do a, an undo. I could easily just go back into the sink and start again and then redo that color pass. So it's, it's good to have things be as uh, less, as least destructive as possible when you're video editing. Um, kind of same thing goes with audio mixing, you know, routing things to buses as opposed to just doing everything on the tracks themselves. Just so if you want to easily revert back to other versions or change things to a full uh, version of something, um, it's easy to kind of backtrack to another sequence. And so that's kind of what I've done here. These are in basically sequential versions of completion. So this is like fully raw, this is synced, this is the first kind of normalized color pass. Um, 
And then at that point, we would move on to the edit itself. Um, now, once again, there are definitely editors who will just edit along with the log version because they don't even want to think about, they might be sending it off to somebody else to color or they don't want to think about that yet. This is kind of more of a personal preference thing where I just like looking at a good looking image while I'm editing. It's, it's pretty much as simple as that. Um, and so now once we are all synced up, our files are synced, um, they're stacked on top of each other. So this is my wide angle. Then I have a kind of medium of the face from the side. And then I have a close up of fingers here, uh, which there are times when it gets uh, in focus and I haven't uh, <laughs> looked at one yet. Um, and then I have these letterbox bars, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this is basically my synced and colored and now I'm ready to actually start cutting. Um, now, once again, this is another personal preference thing, just the way that I like my, my project to look. Um, but I actually, at this editing point, I actually delete the camera audio, uh, the attached camera audio from each of the files, just because once you start to stack up to five, six, seven, eight cameras, um, and it, it can actually really inflate this sequence a lot, and it can be a lot to scroll through. So <clears throat> I actually just delete, uh, I remove the, I separate the audio from the video, so now I'm only looking at the video files here. Um, there are ways to kind of minimize or hide or that kind of thing. But once again, I've just kind of personally got used to, if I need anything from the audio, I can just go back to a previous version and pull it back up. Um, but I just kind of like only looking at the video and then the mix here. And so before we get into the editing style, I think I saw a chat coming in. So the question was, is there a way to keep the image playback smooth after you've colored it? Uh, my playback will jerk a lot after I do too much processing, so I haven't been able to edit with colorized process video. That's a great question. Yeah, and that's actually um, also the reason why um, I don't do a ton to the footage um, until I've edited it because it does tend to slow it down a lot. And so <clears throat> this first color pass that I've done is a really light, just kind of general curves and that kind of thing, but I haven't done any heavy you know, I haven't added any plugins. I haven't done any kind of actual color grading. Um, it's really just been a utilitarian, just um, basically making the color look normal. Um, now, there are ways if it's even um, still slow, and I'm actually on my laptop right now for the Zoom uh, and webcam, but I usually edit on my PC, which is a lot more strong. And so when I do have to edit on my laptop, sometimes I actually need to take off the effects while I'm editing. So in Premiere, you can actually just toggle this global effects mute, which takes off the effects that you've done before, um, and that can make it run smoother. Um, and so, you know, if even with just the color adjustment, you just can't edit it because there's too much going on. You can just kind of toggle off that effect and you can keep going ahead. Another thing you can do is just lower the playback resolution. Um, so right now I'm not even at full because I know I can't watch that on my laptop without it being really slow. Um, you know, you could bring it down to a quarter quality. Um, and if it's a 4K file, you can actually bring it down to an eighth and a 16th. So. Um, yeah, there are a few ways to just kind of make it easier on your computer, um, which can be removing the effects. Um, you know, even after you've applied them and done the work, you can just kind of turn them off so they don't apply, but they're still there. Um, and then you can turn down the playback resolution here to just, and I, we have to do that all the time. We're regularly um, editing our projects at a quarter or a half uh, quality just because it can't process all the things that we've done to it in real time. Um, Great, and so um, once we've moved on to the edit, um, this is kind of where we'll talk a little bit more about just style and kind of, um, you know, some of this um, gets a little bit subjective, but um, I'll talk you through kind of the way that Kevin and I approach just our, our editing style from project to project. Um, so generally, and this plays in a little bit to the way that you, well, it plays in a lot to the way that you shoot things, um, which is, the idea of, I think Kevin might have talked about this a little bit last week, but basically having contrasting angles to pull from. Um, and once you do that, cutting between contrasting angles as opposed to cutting between angles that look really similar to each other. Um, now, in this case, I actually don't have a, an example of that because it's something that we try not to do. Um, but say you had your wide, um, your wide shot was here, but then maybe, 
the only thing that you changed, if you had a second camera on the day, <clears throat> maybe the only thing that you changed was it was a little bit closer and maybe it was like panned over just a little bit. So your two angles were this and that. It can be really jarring for a viewer to see those kinds of cuts um, because they're so similar that you can kind of still place yourself in basically where the cameras are and it's not enough of a change to um, feel like a cut. And so I'll just play it. So it's a really jarring cut. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel very natural. You wouldn't see that in like, you know, generally music videos or films or that kind of thing. And obviously there are always, always exceptions to all of these things for, for whatever reason. Um, so, and that's something, that's actually a pretty common thing that we'll see when we just kind of look at people's videos who were shot, you know, they might just be starting out and they're filming something on their own is they might just kind of put two cameras sort of right next to each other, or maybe they'll be um, basically in the same framing. So maybe they're both wide, even though they're from different parts of the room. So it helps a lot as a starting point to have a wide, a medium, and a close. Um, th those are kind of like the general things to start with. And if you don't have three cameras, then maybe it's just the wide and the close, or like a medium wide and a close. So in this case, I've pulled down our wide, and then when we jump to our medium, which is this one, you'll see that we actually pan, we walked around with the camera quite a bit. And so now instead of just being directly, you know, profile like we were in the wide, we're actually at this 45 degree angle now. And so when you cut from that to that, it actually feels like a new angle and it doesn't feel jarring. Whereas, you know, if you go back to that original, um, that original cut, it feels really jarring when you cut, it's called cutting down the line. So if you basically drew a line from the master camera to the person, but you cut just to something closer to it, um, it just feels really strange. And so we always try and just make sure that we're A, filming with angles that have enough contrast on the day, um, but B, when you're actually editing, um, you know, it's not that say you have four cameras and you do want to have two wides from different vantage points. It's not that you just shouldn't film them. It's that maybe you don't cut to them sequentially. So if you do want to go from you know one wide to the slightly closer wide, you might want to consider doing an extreme close up in between them just to kind of break up the flow and then you come back out. And that's something that you know if you're watching TV shows on Netflix or movies or whatever, maybe just pay attention to the cuts that they're doing and you'll see really often that um, this is generally the kind of cut that happens. So you know if it's a conversation, it might be, one's over one shoulder of a person and the other's, you know, over the shoulder of another person having a conversation. Um, so they're actually, the camera's pointing in completely different ways. I um, mean, it actually makes the, the edit feel a little bit more natural and engaging versus kind of cutting to things that are too similar. Um, and so another factor, once you kind of get into the thick of uh, the edit, um, and once again, you know, we're talking pretty specifically about performance video music edits here, um, is to generally consider whether it makes sense to um, match the pacing of the uh, edit to the music. Um, and this is something that, you know, Kevin and I, I do all the time. And so, you know, if, if the tempo or if the activity becomes more active, um, cutting more frequently. Whereas, you know, I have this, um, for example, in this piece, there's a long build on one note, basically from Niente all the way up to a peak. So instead of doing a bunch of really active cuts on that, I might actually just do one really long shot on that and I might fade in the entire thing. So it looks something like this. Which is probably what I'm actually eventually gonna do once I <laughs> edit this video for real. Um, and, but, you know, in contrast to something like, something like this, which is very dynamic and the chords are shifting and, you know, the harmony is shifting and there's rhythmic activity, then maybe there I might be cutting pretty frequently between the hand and the face. I might, I think Kevin also talked about this last week, but, um, you know, 
shot size and maybe I'll stick to all close-ups on that because I want it all to be about the intensity of the eyes and maybe you see like a, a bead of sweat and you see the fingers moving around um, and maybe I save this wide um, till the very last note or something. So it's all about building that intensity. So generally just trying to match your edit to the piece that, um, that the video is for. Um, and, you know, it can be a bit of a slippery slope to do that, um, especially once you maybe only have one or two cameras to, well, one wouldn't mean you would be doing a multicam, but if you only had two angles to choose from, because cutting back and forth from the same angle over and over again in something rhythmic might actually feel pretty jarring too. And so that's just another consideration is if you only have two cameras, um, you know, you might consider for the more active part of the piece, actually just filming that one a bunch of times, um, just so you can get a bunch of different takes of it and you have things to cut to, because it can feel a little grating and tiring to kind of jump back and forth between the two, same two angles over and over again. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, um, there are also <clears throat> chances where maybe uh, not editing is actually the thing to do. Um, I think on our first session, Kevin and I showed some examples of long single take videos that we've done where we actually don't edit at all. Um, that's something that we, it's kind of like our, a part of our style that we really like. Um, and so, you know, if it does feel like the piece might actually just work really well, kind of only being a close up on your eyes for four minutes, maybe that's just what it should be and you shouldn't actually do any cutting in it. And so, you know, it, obviously the example, the specifics will depend, um, but really it's just a matter of thinking about the piece that you're filming and just kind of thinking ahead of time and during the edit, what actually matches this? Um, you know, what can I use to get across the feeling of the piece in my edit. Um, it's not purely just a functional thing of like, I need to show the wide and the close and the hands and the face, but instead it's actually using the edit to tell a story um, along with the music. So um, kind of diving a little bit just into um, the actual cutting. So once you actually have started cutting your video um, there are a few different, well, there are a lot of different um, actual cuts between clips that you can use. And once again, plenty of tutorials on YouTube on what all the different kinds of cut, cut points are. Um, but I'm just going to go through a couple that I would say 410 uses um, the most often um, and kind of can be used as tools in the tool belt. So um, the first one is pretty obvious, which is basically just a hard cut between um, one angle to another. So basically, you know, one frame ends and the, the next one hits on the next one. So that'd be something like this. So all I've done is just cut in from one shot to the other. Um, now, if it might be a little bit more of a, an amorphous transition um, or you want to elongate, you know, a transition from one shot to another, you might add a crossfade. Um, it's probably the next um, most standard kind, kind of cut. Um, and so here's a little dissolve there. Um, I'm sure most of you know what a cross dissolve is, but that would be a tool if I wanted to cross dissolve between two clips. Um, and so, you know, very dependent on the music, um, whether it feels like it calls for these kind of smooth transitions or whether it wants a hard cut. Um, typically, Kevin and I lean just out of personal preference pretty hard on the hard cuts. Um, we're not big cross dissolve people, um, but it definitely has its, its place and, um, you know, it can be used creatively and we've seen it done really well. Um, so just tools in the toolbox. Um, another one, which I showed you first is basically a fade to and from uh, black or white. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning of a video, we'll pretty often do a fade from black. Um, but there can also be creative points to even if you're not at the beginning of a video, but maybe you're just between sections. Um, you know, this is something I, I like doing, which is you might actually do a hard cut and you actually have the next shot fade in from black. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people think of, you know, fade to or from black and they think like beginning of piece, end of piece, but there can actually be a lot of creative ways to do it uh, from take to take as well. Um, and obviously it doesn't have to just be from black. You could also do it from a white screen as well, which um, can kind of give a, and you know, the feeling of getting washed by, you know, white light or whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, that fading in and out of black versus fading between clips is the other one. 
Um, and then <clears throat> within those, um, one more thing that I just want to bring up is basically the idea of cutting on action points. Um, and so, you know, you notice when I just pulled this up, I kind of picked this moment when this first peak has been reached and then we cut back down to Miente in the piece. So kind of using that as your point to do an edit versus kind of just doing it, you know, wherever. There are times when that might work because maybe you want to see like the reaction to that high note or whatever, you know, there are plenty of reasons why these things can change from a case to case basis, but something to consider is maybe, um, you know, good edit points are when something shifts or there's a, you know, there's a big hit or there's a, you know, big note or whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind to kind of elevate edits from just a purely functional multicam edit, um, but actually turning them into a dynamic living, breathing thing that uh, matches along with the music. Um, and a lot of this stuff just kind of becomes intuitive. Obviously, I think most of the people I'm talking to are musicians. And so you already kind of understand where these peaks are and these crests are and that kind of thing. And so it can come more naturally to edit that way. Um, but sometimes, you know, it can be a little bit more of a thought process of like, you know, why do I want this edit point where it is? And is there a better reason to do it somewhere else? And that kind of thing. Um, and so that's just kind of a brief overview of um, just generally different kinds of edits that you can do once you're cutting. And so in this case, you know, I might start with some long fades here at this beginning part. But then once we really get into the, you know, the meaty kind of rhythmic stuff of the piece, maybe I'm cutting between all the close up shots and then maybe at the end, you know, I do something else. And so, yeah, really just matching the edit style to the piece um, is just an important consideration to keep in mind. And so now once we've um, kind of made our, our multicam edit, which um, obviously I have not done here, but just as an, you know, quickly chop this up and whatever this might look like from the end, then I would basically copy that sequence and I would turn that into our final pass sequence here. And so pretend like this is just beautifully edited and I spent tons of hours on it and it's beautiful. Um, from this point on, then this is kind of where the more creative kind of icing on the top uh, <clears throat> um, elements start to come into play. And so, for example, in this case, um, you'll notice that, um, actually, I think this was present in our edit as well, but I added these black bars on the top and bottom. So you'll notice in the first file, you could actually see our lights and you could see the PA speaker down here in the corner and there's a lot of extra stuff in the frame. Um, Kevin and I tend to shoot in uh, an aspect ratio that's 235 to 1, um, which is basically replicating that of anamorphic uh, cinema lenses. Um, and so that kind of is the black bars on the top and the bottom, um, which kind of just makes that widescreen 235 by 1 aspect ratio. There might be creative reasons why you maybe want to crop it into a square, or you want to crop it into a circle, or you want it to be extremely widescreen, like maybe it's only just a tiny little sliver of something, um, because there's, you know, something that would relate to that in the program notes of the piece or whatever it might be. Um, and so this is kind of that step when you might start to add those kinds of decisions. Um, now, that being said, those are all things that are really important to consider before you shoot. And so obviously, you know, you can see the two lights at the top of the frame here. You can see the PA speaker in the bottom left. Kevin and I shot this because we knew that we would be in this aspect ratio. Um, it's not like we shot a normal video and then just tacked black and uh, black letterbox bars on the top and bottom. So that's a really important part of it is, you know, if you do want to shoot a video and you want it to be a square for whatever reason, or you want it to be vertical instead of um, landscape mode, those are all things that should be thought through before you shoot so you can actually frame accordingly. Um, that's kind of another sort of thing that is a alarm bell of kind of amateur uh, filmmaking is when it looks like, you know, people just kind of shot a normal video but then tacked some widescreen letterbox bars on it, but maybe this was their frame. And so they're actually like, you know, cutting off the head and the foot, um, but they just wanted to put that on because they thought it would look cool it's better to actually plan for that stuff um, ahead of time. And then at this point, you're just kind of implementing those, those parts of it. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, what might come into play here is an actual color grade. 
Um, so instead of just correction of, you know, fixing the white balance and bringing it from log to rec 709, maybe this is when you actually like, you know, this piece has a water theme and you actually want the entire thing to be blue like that. You know, this is kind of that step where you start to put whatever um, creative adjustments you might want to over top of it. Um, now it's really important, you know, this is something that Kevin and I think about a lot is basically the, if you are gonna make any creative decisions at this point in the editing process, it always works better when those are thought through and integrated beforehand, as opposed to just being tacked on after the fact. So, you know, for uh, taking that underwater example that I just said, where I just cool this down a bunch. Um, sometimes it can look really forced or out of place if you're doing those things purely in uh, post-production. It, it can kind of look like you just maybe put an Instagram filter on it or whatever it might be. So maybe if you want that to be the effect, maybe you actually have all blue lights in the space. So your actual color grade isn't that crazy, but it's just that you shot it in a way that was, you know, reflected the creative element of it. Um, <clears throat> same thing goes if you, you know, throw various effects, whether it might be like a, you know, if you want it to look like it was a VHS tape or a, you know, 35 millimeter film or eight millimeter film, or you want to like distort it in some way. Um, if the footage wasn't originally shot in a way that, you know, you were, you were meaning to integrate it with that kind of effect, it can look a little bit wonky. Um, you know, it's like, it would be strange if you just set up a camera in the practice room with like, you know, your desk in the back and you just played it with all of your stuff around, but then you just added some like fireworks over top of it or whatever it might be, you know, it, the effects need to be integrated into the shooting as well for it to come across um, accurately in editing. So generally Kevin and I don't do anything super crazy at this point. I mean, we may add a bit of like a, a look to it, whether we just kind of bring the whole thing, um, you know, if we just make it darker for whatever reason we want to, or uh, we might desaturate it for some reason, if we want it to look a little bit bleaker or whatever it might be. But usually everything at this point stays um, pretty normal. We don't do anything super crazy, um, unless the project calls for some kind of effect, in which case we, you know, we shot in a way that it would lend itself to that kind of edit. And this would also be um, the last thing I'll say here before moving on to um, just brief thing about exporting um, <clears throat> is to not underestimate the um, power of just the design and the branding um, and like the titling and that kind of thing. Um, you know, there are definitely pretty much with every video that we do, um, there's definitely a period of an hour or two or three where I just basically switch mode from video editor and I'm full on graphic designer mode because I'm actually, you know, doing typography and I'm searching for fonts online and I'm matching colors of the fonts to, you know, the images in the video and that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, in this day and age when people kind of need something enticing, uh, you know, as they're scrolling through whatever really quickly, basically right from the get go, um, this is kind of the stage of the edit to make sure that, you know, your title and if you have, if you want to include the name of the piece and the performer and all that stuff that it actually, you know, you spent some time on it and that it actually maybe fades in with the music in time or it cuts out with the music um, or, you know, the font might be related to the project in some way um, or you, you know, color eyedropper, the, the color of the font to actually be a color from the video footage or whatever it might be, just, um, you know, actually taking some time to craft the, the titles and whatever branding you might want at the beginning. Um, and then obviously same thing goes for the end, any credits, um, 410 has our logo that we always tack on at the end. Um, and then once we're all done, so once we've synced, colored, edited, and then done all of our final pass um, revisions, um, you know, with our, any creative elements and the titling and that kind of thing, then it comes time to export. Um, and the most important, once again, there's, um, you know, a lot of resources online for basically the, the best export settings for whatever kind of um, project that you're doing. And fortunately, programs like Premiere have a lot of different presets um, that are pretty hard to um, go wrong with. If you just kind of say, like, I know this was shot at 1080 and it's ending up on YouTube in HD, then that's probably going to be um, pretty close to what you want. But it's worth double checking once again, in the same way when you made your sequence, double checking that um, the sequence matched all of your uh, footage um, settings, same thing goes with uh, the export here. 
And so, you know, double checking that you're still exporting at the same resolution, so 1920 by 1080, double check that you're still exporting at the same frame rate, so 23976, that's the same as my footage and my sequence. Um, and then just kind of making sure that it's at um, the quality that you want it to be. And so, you know, you have a few different, and this gets a little bit nitty gritty, but um, there's a few different options for basically your bit rate, um, your kind of encoding settings. And so our cameras, um, I think we shot this one a little bit higher than, uh, I think this was at 160, but you know, at this particular preset, the highest I can go is 50, but basically just making sure that it's exporting at the highest quality that it can, while also still being a manageable file size for YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, every step of the way, basically just double checking that all of your settings are still matching what you filmed at. Um, you know, if, if you filmed at 30 frames a second, um, but then you edit and then you export at 23, 976, it's gonna look strange and the computer is gonna be trying to fill in frames that aren't there and that kind of stuff. So just making sure that everything aligns from top to bottom. Um, so that was kind of an onslaught of information. I feel like I spoke a million miles per hour, but um, zooming back out here from my Premiere session, does anyone have any questions about any of that? I feel like that was a lot. I'm sorry for talking your ears off, but any questions about any step of that? This is so, it's really amazing. So thanks for talking our ears off. That's why we're here. I've just been kind of trying to get it all in. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, can you talk about uh, more about calling for beginners? Um, sure. So I am actually going to go back into my premiere. So I will see y'all on the computer. Um, <clears throat> so I definitely won't claim to be a, you know, a color grading uh, master by any means. Um, but generally, um, what you will be looking at for coloring. So you'll see that in this case, where is it? Um, in Premiere, I pulled up um, an effect called Lumetri Color, which is kind of Premiere's um, sort of color, general coloring um, plugin that you can apply. And so in this case, um, I actually have some um, presets that basically take it from that kind of log left-hand image to the, the Rec. 709 right-hand image. But if you were to do it manually, um, which unfortunately 410 just doesn't really have time to do given all the projects that we have going on. So we do, do use a lot of um, shortcuts like this. Um, basically what you would go in, uh, what you would do is you would go in and actually mess with all of the um, curves. And so I think this might be a little bit to, much to get into here, but basically there are a few different um, areas that you can um, essentially manipulate with the footage. So you can mess with the shadow level here for exposure um, and the highlight level. So bring up the highlights and bring down the shadows. Um, there's kind of a more just sort of overall brute force contrast that this applies. So if I were to take off that, you know, I think we know what the, the brightness and the contrast sliders do here. Um, and then the pure whites and the pure blacks here. And then once you um, get past that into the actual color, um, you can basically do those kinds of adjustments for each color channel. And so you might have the RGB curves. And so for example, um, you actually have a curve just for the reds. And so you might bring down the reds or you might highlight the reds. Um, and depending on where you pull it on here, um, it's basically whether it's applying that to the highlights or the midtones or the shadows. Um, and you can go in and change each individual color channel uh, depending on where it falls in the exposure range. And so my green, same thing here. And then my blue, same thing here. Um, and so, and obviously once you do that, you can kind of do saturation levels and that kind of thing, tint levels for each of those individual um, color channels for RGB. And so it gets, it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. There's a, a lot of different um, small adjustments that you can make. Um, and like I said, we um, usually don't have time to start from scratch with color every single time. And so we kind of have some um, go-tos that we like that um, just kind of applies our, um, the look that we are going for. And then at that point, we'll just do sort of fine tune adjustments. And so if we're looking at it and it feels 
extra warm um, in the highlights for whatever reason, we'll go in and kind of desaturate those, bring those down or whatever it might be. Um, but in Premiere, that usually happens all in this Lumetri color plugin. Um, and so the, the one that I pulled up um, when I went into that um, color pass here was, like I said, basically one that just brings the log to a normal Rec. 709 here, just kind of brings in contrast and color to, um, to all the channels that were really flat beforehand. So I think that was a pretty quick breeze over that, but um, coloring can get pretty, uh, pretty advanced pretty quick. And so, um, and there's tons and tons of resources of people who know a lot, a lot more than I do on that online. So, um, so yeah, that's a quick little overview there. Going back into the chat here. Um, I've always wondered, do you edit with scores as references? Um, <clears throat> we, do, um, we'll usually use the score for basically the initial um, assembly of it. Um, so, you know, if we're doing a recording session, we'll usually just need a score to actually know where all the cuts are and when we cut from take to take and that kind of thing. Um, so that wouldn't apply so much to this kind of like stacked lip synced version, but that would actually be like if we film a recording session or that kind of thing, um, then it's really important that we have a score right next to us and we know where we are in the piece. But honestly, once it, gets past that point. Um, well, and I guess I should back up uh, from that. Usually it's useful for us to have um, at least like things like program notes and just general score notes ahead of time, just so we know if there's like some kind of overall theme to the piece or that kind of thing. We, we know whether we should be matching that with the way that we shoot it. Um, but once we actually get into the multicam edit of it, um, I actually don't really use a score ever, and I don't think Kevin does either. At that point, it's basically just, we've internalized the piece itself enough and the trajectory and the music and all that. Um, so that at that point, it's really just a instinctual um, editing process. So the, the score is more useful for kind of the first couple steps of onboarding with the music, the piece's concept and the, you know, if we need to do any take assembly and that kind of stuff. But um, once we are in the actual multicam editing process, then we're just kind of on to just using our ears and eyes. Um, okay, so next question. Any favorite tutorials or resources for building fluency in Premiere? I feel like I have a lot of baseline, or I, I feel like I have some baseline knowledge, but I lack a lot of the nuance necessary to make higher quality content. Um, that's a great question. Um, I actually wish I had a slightly better answer to that other than I think my, my route has basically always just been whenever I run into a specific problem, I just go to YouTube and type in what that problem is and then someone has answered it at some point. <laughs> um, I know that that's not quite as streamlined as actually just having one place to go for everything and I'm sure those exist um, and I might just need to think about um, what those are. But um, in my experience, just from um, learning how to do this on my own, um, it's really just been like diving in. And then basically, as soon as I get to a question that I have, whether it's like, how do I, you know, apply whatever it might be, then I just go into YouTube and type it in. And then it's a list of videos of people um, talking it through. So um, I feel like that wasn't the greatest answer to that. But that's just what's worked for my personal experience. Um, I'm sure there are great courses and, you know, series of tutorials and that kind of thing online, but um, I've usually just been on a case by case, um, ask YouTube for all the answers type of uh, thing. So, yeah. I'm curious how much you think about um, ahead of time, you know, you talk a lot about pre planning and, and camera angles. And um, I mean, do you do you do storyboarding? And, and kind of really thinking about what the edit is going to be, or like to what degree do you really go that deep um, when you're shooting? It depends on the project. Um, the more like conceptual and choreographed things need to be, the more that we actually will um, come up with, you know, Google Docs or whatever it might be, um, or storyboards. Um, but honestly, you know, Kevin and I are, are a slightly different case in that we really just shoot with each other so much and we've been shooting just the two of us for however many years. And so at this point, it's basically become a really quick shorthand for us of like, we just kind of know which angles are gonna to work together with, with other angles. Um, but if it's, a more, if it's more of like a conceptualized music video where we actually need to you know, chunk out a shot list or that kind of thing, then we'll um, storyboard that out. Um, but for, you know, for performance videos, and especially if it's like a solo, like the Timo video that I was showing, 
Um, at, the, at this point, it's basically just become kind of second nature for us to know what angles we're going to need. And um, it's like, you getting the, yeah, we got the, okay, we're good. <laughs> it's kind of that kind of conversation. So, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, going into the chat, um, thanks for reminding me to talk about the phone app. The one that I was thinking of is called Moment. Um, the Moment app, they're a company that basically just make <clears throat> professional video and photo equipment for the phone. Um, so I actually have like a lens adapter um, that goes onto the phone and it makes the phone lens into an anamorphic uh, framed lens. Um, and so they, they kind of do things geared towards people who want to use their phone to make more professional cinematic kind of um, uh, videos. And so, yeah, they have in their app, the moment app. Um, I don't know if it has a more specific name than that in the uh, app store. Yeah, I think it's just moment. Um, you can actually go in and override the auto settings on your phone. Um, so you can tell it what shutter speed you want and ISO and color and all that kind of stuff. Um, but honestly, I mean, that, that question plays a lot into, um, I think Kevin's chat last week as well, which is, um, you know, things are only gonna look as good as what they're looking at. And so lighting has a lot to do with that and, you know, location and framing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think a general misconception is that like the camera and the lens, if they're really expensive can make things look good. And that's unfortunately, I mean, it, it helps with, the pixel information and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, if you're lit well, um, kind of using the techniques that Kevin talked about last week, and if you're in a nice looking location and all that kind of stuff, um, the phone footage can look just as good as, you know, anything else. Um, obviously there's a bit of a just quality difference from the pixels and the grain and all that kind of stuff, but the image itself, um, you know, more has to do with the lighting and, and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, would recommend Moment and everything they offer. The lenses are great um, and the app is great and I use it all the time for just like personal projects and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, what kinds of cameras do you use? Um, 410 is all on Canons, um, just kind of, that's where we started and that's where we've been all along. We've just never, never left. So um, our main cameras are Canon C300 Mark IIs, um, which are kind of like the main cameras that we use all the time. Um, and then we supplement that with Canon C100s are kind of like our extra cameras whenever we need them. Um, and usually we film mostly with uh, Sigma art lenses. Um, so um, not the actual Canon L glass, but the uh, Sigma kind of cheaper equivalent of them. So um, yeah, we kind of have a couple of Sigma lenses that we go to all the time. They're 18 to 35 and they're 50 millimeter. Um, but yeah, we're mostly just all in the, in the Canon world these days. So um, yeah. While people are thinking of any other questions that they might have, um, I just wanted to post in the chat. We've archived the first two of these. So if you missed any of them, um, you can see they, those. And uh, they're also on our YouTube channel um so so go ahead and, and check those out there okay thanks, yeah well thanks thanks for joining us i just put in the chat a uh, link to our website and to um 410 website as i mentioned at the beginning um we're doing this uh for free but paying all of our artists and would love to have your support um we have uh, some great workshops coming up that i just put down into the chat uh, coming up next week is um, Ryan Streber of Octav Octavan Audio. Uh, then Ashley Bathgate is premiering three great new works by our Next Fest 2020 composers. Um, she's just amazing, I'm sure you know, and I know that that Evan and Kevin know Ashley well. Um, and then we have some more financial works workshops coming up, and um, some workshops with uh, Jason Haheim of uh, the of the Met Orchestra about deliberate practice. I think it's really important that we keep our um, keep our artistic game going on too in these times because uh, we're, we're just about to start playing concerts again. So we want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have something to share. So anyway, thanks everybody for being here and uh, hope to see you next week uh, with Ryan and uh, some, some workshops on recording new music at home and in the studio. After you finish up those workshops, you can call up uh, Kevin and Evan and, and book your 
video shoot and uh there should be some kind of next fest package we'll, we'll work on that right okay well thanks so much everybody for joining us and hope to see you next week and and every thursday for a while after that thanks again evan we really appreciate it take care Thank you. Take care.